All right, good morning. My name is Mark Erickson, and today I am very happy to be talking to you about debugging JavaScript and React. A couple quick things about myself. Uh, I am a front-end engineer at Replay, where we're building a time-traveling debugger for JavaScript. We will touch on that a little bit later on. Uh, I am an answer of questions. I will answer questions pretty much anywhere there is a text box on the internet. Uh, I collect all kinds of useful and interesting links to articles and blog posts and anything else that seems like it might be relevant at some point. I am a writer of very long blog posts, uh, my like 6,000, 12,000 words, somewhere in that general range. Uh, and I am a Redux maintainer. Uh, I've worked on a lot of our documentation, done a lot of things with Redux Toolkit and React Redux. But most people know me as that guy with the Simpsons avatar. So we're going to talk about a few different things today. We're going to talk, a lot of this is actually not even going to be specific to JavaScript. A lot of this is sort of a, a general mental or scientific approach to how you actually think about debugging. Uh, we are going to talk about some JavaScript specific things as we go, but really a lot of this is applicable no matter what language or framework you're trying to use. So let's start with some debugging concepts and philosophy. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the, you know, the concept of debugging, it says, it's the process of finding or resolving bugs, defects that prevent the software from working correctly. In other words, why is it broken and how do we fix this? Now, when we think about programmers, you know, the usual stereotype is that you know, it's late at night, you're hunched over your keyboard, drinking some caffeine, deep in the code, furiously typing like crazy. But we all know that in reality, programming is a lot more than that. We spend a lot of time trying to plan what we're actually going to build. We spend time communicating with the other people on our team, discussing what we're going to do. We spend time reviewing code, putting up PRs, discussing comments, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why things aren't, things aren't working. And the reality is that developers spend a very significant amount of time debugging and fixing our code, and yet a lot of people really aren't comfortable or they're not confident doing this. Now, I've, I've spent some time trying to think about, like, why don't a lot of developers know how to debug, or why haven't they really spent time thinking about the process of debugging? And I've come up with a few different reasons. Um, one is that, based on my experience and what I've seen talking to other people, debugging is generally not taught as a concept in school. I mean, I, I had a four-year CS degree, and we, were, we never had, like, a class on how to actually approach debugging. It was just something you're supposed to sort of pick up as you go. And that means that most of us really learned debugging the hard way over the, in, over the years. And the thing is, debugging is really a very critical skill for developers, but the good news is it's something that you can learn, you can think about, and you can get better at. So let's talk about some core principles of debugging. And again, a lot of this is very generic. It's not even specific to JavaScript. And the first one is that every problem has a cause, and it should be possible to figure out what actually went wrong and hopefully how to fix it. Now, just because it's possible to figure it out does not mean it's going to be easy. There's a lot of things that could make that hard. Um, we want our programs to run consistently, but in, in truth, programs often have very non-deterministic behavior. It's going to behave a little bit differently every time you run the program. And that could be something as simple as generating a, a different random ID every time you reload the page, or it could be very complex async behavior that depends on different parts of the system. It may be very hard to reproduce the issue, or it could just be a very difficult environment. Like, maybe I can't even run this on my own machine. I have to deploy it to a production server and then wait a few days and collect the logs, and hopefully I have enough information to be able to investigate it further. But ultimately, starting from the mindset that there should be a possibility to understand what is broken and why. Now, it's also very important to be able to understand what the intended behavior of the system is. If bug means that something is wrong with the system, 
That means we have to know what the correct behavior was supposed to be in the first place in order to say that this behavior is actually wrong. So having a good understanding of the, whole, the system as a whole, what the pieces are, how it's supposed to be working, is really necessary in order to actually investigate any bug. It's also absolutely critical to be able to reproduce the issue. Actually having steps that you can follow that make the bug happen. You know, usually this is something like open the page, click on the list, go to the third tab, click the button, kaboom. Now, hopefully the steps are that simple, but in practice it's often a lot more complicated. And this is important because, one, this helps confirm where the problem is happening. If we know that the, that the bug occurs when I click this button, then probably the first place I should start looking is the on-click handler from the button. That, that's somewhere in that area of the code. That also allows further investigation. Once you have the steps to reproduce, then you can make it happen on demand. It gives you a chance to go in and investigate. And then once you actually have a hopeful fix, you can repeat the steps and try to verify that now you actually have fixed the bug and you're not just like hoping that you fixed the bug. It's also important to be able to debug with a plan. Um, debugging is really about the scientific method. You make a hypothesis, you investigate it, you confirm or, de or deny what's actually happening. You need to be very intentional about making changes to the code. I've seen many cases where developers go in and they just start kind of changing code at random, hoping that it's gonna fix things. That really only makes things worse. It's important to, kn to know, here's why I'm going to make this tweak to the code and with the idea that it'll fix things and really only try to change one thing at a time so that you can verify if this change fixed it, not I made 10 changes and now it works, but I don't know which of those 10 changes actually did something. And so this allows you to narrow down the possible causes of what's actually going on. Now, how many, how many times have you, you know, something's gone wrong and you see a giant stack trace and not only did the program break, but like your brain just kind of explodes? You know, there's a you know, 500 line long stack trace and it's like, I have no idea what this means. There's been lots of times when I've been answering questions in Discord or chat channels or somewhere and someone posts a screenshot of an error message and they're like, I have no idea, this broke, help me. And I look at the error message, it's like, it says, you know, could not access field of undefined on line 73 of this file. It's like, did, did, did you read the error message at, at, at all? It's like, no. Now, stack traces and error messages aren't always going to tell you exactly what went wrong. Well, sometimes it might just be a symptom that's downstream of the original problem, but they do have very important information. And so it, it, it's one of, the, one of those like common sense things that feels like I shouldn't have to say it, but I will. Read the error message, please. Like it's, it, it is actually a skill. And you know, being able to look at the error message and actually figure out which pieces of this are important is, is a skill as well. Uh, Swix wrote an article a few years back called How to Google Your Errors that is actually very relevant and helpful. There's a quote from a guy named Brian Kernahan who helped to, to create the C programming language back in the 1970s. And he says, everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. And so if you are really, really clever when you write the code, how are you going to be able to debug it when you get there? Now, th this is really about writing the code, not necessarily the debugging step, but think of how many times you've you know, been investigating an error and you go through a file and you're like, this is ridiculous, who even wrote this code in the first place? And then you look at the git blame, it's like, oh, right, it was me two years ago. And maybe it's you, maybe it's one of your coworkers, but you know, code is not just there to be written to build the feature, code is there to be understood. And maybe it'll be you six months from now, maybe it'll be a teammate of yours after you've left the company in five years, but writing the code so that it can be understood 
is important. You know, queer names, comments, architecture diagrams, whatever it is, to try to give the future person reading this code the ability to understand what's actually going on. So, sort of a, a generalized workflow for trying to investigate and debug code. First step is being able to understand what the problem actually is. How many of us have gotten a bug report that just says, it doesn't work? It's like, great, thank you. That, that really helps me investigate. So being able to understand what the problem is in the first place, or at least what somebody thinks the problem is. I mean, clicking a button and getting an error on screen, okay, that's, that's kind of obvious. But a lot of times the descriptions aren't clear or you know, the behavior is more subtle. So actually understanding what, the, what people think the problem is, is kind of a first step. And then from there, as I said, being able to reproduce the issue. If we're very lucky, it comes with steps to reproduce. Otherwise, you've got to dive in and actually figure out what those are yourself. Step three is sort of the whole like draw the rest of the owl example. It's actually figure out why the bug is happening. And so that's that scientific method approach that I was talking about. But once you actually know why it's happening, a lot of times what we see is just a symptom. It's like, yes, I tried to access an undefined field over here, but that's actually because you know, maybe, maybe our data from the server doesn't match what the TypeScript type say it was supposed to be, and so my code thought it was safe to access this field, and it wasn't. So maybe the real root cause is that, you know, the server and the client don't agree on what the data should be. And so we really should actually address this by dealing with the root cause of validating the data over here instead of just adding a question dot null check over here and where we actually access the code. So at that point, we can try and determine what the best problem approach is for trying to fix this. And again, like if possible, you ought to try to address the root cause, not just the symptoms. But you know, there are constraints. Maybe, maybe we have a deadline. Maybe this piece of the code is really complex. Um, maybe, like, maybe the best answer is rip it out and throw it all away, but we don't actually have time for that. And so trying to be able to figure out what the best plan is based on those constraints. Then actually fix the issue, put up the PR, hopefully deal with it. Um, but if possible, trying to add more checks to keep this from happening again. You know, adding unit tests, regression tests, whatever. And then finally, documenting things as much as possible. Um, this can range from you know, improving the code, adding comments, writing a very clear git commit message, uh, PR descriptions, uh, linear uh, issue tracking descriptions, leaving a trail so that it's clear what this change was, why you made it, what the original problem was, and what you had to do to fix the issue in the end. All right, so a few other general tips for debugging. Um, generic, but hopefully useful and applicable. Use the right tool for the job. Um, there are a lot of different tools for debugging, and we're actually going to talk about some of these in just a minute. But the more tools that you have in your toolbox conceptually, the better equipped you'll be to address any one given issue. Also, as programmers, we're always dealing with abstractions, whether it's using a third-party library, calling from one system to another. And you may be comfortable working at one level of abstraction, but if you at least have an idea what the next level deeper is actually doing, you'll have a better understanding of, of the system as a whole and be better equipped to go investigate. And that can include, like, if we're using a third-party library, maybe I actually dive inside the code of the library on GitHub or inside of node modules so that I can see what that code's doing. It's not my code, but it's running on my system, so actually maybe it is my code, so I should go investigate. Also, don't be afraid. Um, I've, I've had plenty of times where I saw an error message and my brain kind of locked up. It's like, oh no, this is too hard. I, I don't know this part of the system that belongs to another team. I don't think I can solve this. And so, you know, taking a deep breath and being able to step back and say, you know, this is possible. I can figure it out. It's going to take some work, but I can do it. And then finally, 
knowing when to keep going and when to stop, I love my focus time. Like there is nothing better than you know an entire five or six hour block of uninterrupted time where I can get deep in the code and just like really load it all in my head, you know, try things out, get in the rhythm, rhythm music going. And we need that, but sometimes we get stuck. And there's been lots of times where the best thing that I could do was just close my laptop for the, for the day, go do something else, take a break, get some sleep, come back in the morning, and literally the next morning I solved it in like five minutes. So being able to just step away from it and let your brain both rest and kind of chew through it in the background is useful. All right, so let's talk about a few specific techniques and tools. Uh, something that I see a lot is the question of, should I use a graphical debugger or just put console logs everywhere? And I say, why not both? This is, this is kind of what I was saying earlier with that, you know, like more tools in your toolbox thing. Now, print logging is something that exists in every language, every framework. It's very easy to add. You, know, you just put, you know, put console logs everywhere or you know, system.out.println if you're using Java or whatever. These are useful because they can show us changes over time. If we add a bunch of log statements to different files, we can look at them, we can see the path, we can see that this fu function ran and then this value and then this value. They're available everywhere. Um, your local development environment, the browser, node, remote servers. Logging is very helpful. And a lot of times you can have different levels of logging and be able to maybe you know, have the info level on in production, but then optionally turn on debug logging as you need it to get more data. But then there's graphical debuggers. Um, out of curiosity, how many people here actually do use a graphical debugger on a semi-frequent basis? Okay, yeah, maybe half-ish or so, which actually sort of proves my point. Graphical debuggers are very useful for being able to drill down into specific behavior on your local machine. They're great for being able to step through a program one line at a time, see individual values. And so they're great if, they're, if you're in an environment where you can use one, but you know, as I said, it's very hard to use a graphical debugger if your program is running on a server in AWS, Kubernetes, 15,000 copies of the program at once. So there's a lot of things you can do with print debugging. Um, as I said, every different language and framework has its own methods for doing logging. Uh, be aware of what those are. It's useful to be able to check the timestamps. It's useful to be able to have multiple levels of logging that you can turn on and off. Uh, for JavaScript specifically, we you know, pretty much everyone here should be familiar with console.log, but there's actually a lot of other methods available on the console object. There's methods for different levels of log logging, info and error and debug. Uh, there's methods for being able to format objects. You can use group to, to automatically do a collapsible group of messages together. You can use table to format up an array of objects as a table. There's built-in functions for doing start and end timestamps or auto printing a stack trace every time you get to a specific line of code. A uh, couple things to remember that I see people trip up on a lot of times. So we can pass you know, both strings and individual values to console.log and the other methods. Uh, and that means that we can pass objects and arrays. And when we do that, they'll show up in the console panel in the, in the browser dev tools. And those objects and arrays are interactive and expandable, and you can look at them. But what you're seeing there is the current live value. So if I log an object here, and then a couple seconds later, my code mutates that object. And then I expand it and I look at it. What you're seeing is the value after it got changed, not the value as it was at the time that it got logged. And I've seen a lot of people get confused by that one. Um, another fun little trick. So one of the great things about the JavaScript ecosystem is that we distribute libraries as source code installed into node modules. And that's just a .js file on disk. And that means that even though we don't normally look inside of node modules because it's big and scary and there's like 50 million files in there, 
you can go in and edit other library files and add log statements and then rebuild your program. Just, you know, remember to take those away before you deploy it to production. So, let's talk about graphical debuggers for a minute. Um, these exist for every programming language out there, and they all share some very similar concepts. The first one is breakpoints. Now, we, some of you might know the term in relation to CSS, where it's about changing the width of the page. Here, a breakpoint means when the debugger gets to this line of code, stop and pause here, and now you have time to go and inspect what's going on. Now, typically, we can set a breakpoint by opening the source file in the debugger and then clicking in the line number area to say, add a breakpoint here so we can pause. Uh, there's usually a panel somewhere that shows a list of all the breakpoints on all the different files and lines. Uh, you can disable breakpoints temporarily. Most environments will also let you modify breakpoints so that they are conditional. You know, only stop here if some value is true. And some environments also let you set what's called like a watch point, where instead of pausing the program when it gets to that line of code, it actually just prints a message instead. Debuggers also give you the ability to see what's going on in the program while you're paused. There's usually a panel that says, here's all the variables that are in scope at this time. Uh, there's a section called the call stack, which shows you the list of functions that are currently executing at this point in time. And there's the controls to be able to step to the next line of code, step into a function call, step over a function call, or keep going. So if we look at a couple visuals of this, uh, here's where these different controls exist inside of Chrome DevTools. So over here on the left, we've got a breakpoint marker on the line of code. We've got a line that's highlighted that says, here's the line where we're actually paused right now. We have the controls for resuming and stepping over and stepping in or out or to the next line. Uh, we have a list of breakpoints that we've added on different lines of code. We have the variables that exist in the local scope. And we have the call stack with the current functions that are executing. And if I look at a screenshot of VS Code, all those same concepts exist. They may be in different locations, plus, of course, you can drag panels around to customize the UI layout. But basically, all these same controls exist in every graphical debugger. And so once you get familiar with the concepts, they should exist no matter what framework or language you're using. So a few things to keep in mind. Um, one is, how do we actually get to the point where we can use a graphical debugger? Now, if you're using a browser, it's pretty simple. You just pull up the browser dev tools and go to the, the sources or the debugger tab, whatever it's called. Um, if you're trying to debug a non-browser application, whether it's Node or you know, .NET or some other framework, uh, usually there's a way to either launch the program you're investigating as a new process, or if the program is already running, you can tell the debugger to attach itself to the existing process. And then with JavaScript, we actually can use the debugger keyword and put that in our source code, and it's kind of like a hard-coded breakpoint that already exists. So that's, that's a lot of stuff about both general debugging principles and about you know, dealing with some JavaScript stuff. Let's talk about React for a bit. Um, actually, let's, let's step, step backwards. Huh? Um, how many of you ever used an earlier web framework called Backbone? OK, a few, a few of us, most of us are shuddering right now with bad memories. Um, Backbone was really simple. The entire framework was like 3,000 lines of commented JavaScript code. It was very readable. And I can remember a lot of times of sticking a breakpoint in my own code, stepping from my code into Backbone, and stepping out of Backbone into more of my code. Uh, I got very familiar with some of Backbone's internals. And it was very nice because the code was simple and readable, and you could step in and step out, and it made sense. 
you really can't do that with React. Um, if you put a breakpoint inside one of your function components and you look at the call stack, it's like I'm paused inside of to-do list item and below that is a function called render with hooks and then the rest of this is just sort of gibberish and I have no idea what's going on here. And that's with the readable React source code in development. Um, so the bad news is React is a black box. Like technically you can go read the source code. I've read the source code. I'm familiar with a lot of it. But realistically, when you're trying to debug an application, React source code isn't going to help you. What will help you is understanding React's mental model, understanding component life cycles and data flow and being able to think about the process of how does React work, how is data passed from parents to children, how does it flow through the tree, and when are my components actually going to update. So this is where the fundamentals really come into play. You know, going, you're making sure that you know how React renders, how it works, uh, when are my effects going to run. Um, I have numerous articles and I've answered a lot of questions about this over time, but a couple of the key things to remember. Um, when, you, when you update state, the updates are sort of kind of async, as in when I call set state, you can't like log the updated value on the next line of code. I have seen that happen so many times. Um, also remembering that renders get batched up, that you can call set state multiple times in a row and it might only cause one render at the end. And then of course the ever popular, I have a, I have a callback and it's trying to reference a value but that value is now actually kind of out of date. So a lot of this is about understanding the mental model and keeping that in mind. Along with that, using the React DevTools. How many of you have the React DevTools extension installed in your browser? Okay, a little, little more like two-thirds-ish, good. The rest of you, please go install it once we're done here. Uh, the React DevTools extension has always been one of the best things about React. Uh, when you actually look at the DevTools extension, it shows us the entire component tree. We can see the structure of the components, we can click on them, and for every component, we can see here are the props, the state, the hooks, and at least in development, we can see here are the, the ancestors that rendered this component. So this is a very valuable way of understanding what is going on inside your application. Uh, the React DevTools also have a profiler, and so while this is more about performance rather than debugging the execution, uh, this is also a very useful tool for understanding which components rendered and which ones are the most expensive. A uh, couple quick tips. Um, if you are in the browser DevTools and you go to the Elements panel and you select, I don't know, a button or a list item or something, and then you switch over to the React Components tab, it should hopefully actually highlight the component that rendered that DOM node. Uh, alternately, you can use the little selector tool to click on a piece of the page and it should highlight the right component. So what about Redux? Um, Redux was designed to make your state updates predictable and be able to understand when, where, why, and how the state actually updated. And so again, like understanding the mental model and the data flow is key here. Understanding that the UI dispatches an action, that the reducer logic was responsible for updating it, and that the store notifies the UI and things re-render from there. Um, Hopefully I shouldn't have to say this because it's 2024, but a lot of people still aren't aware of this. Uh, how many of you are still using old Redux code legacy patterns and are not using Redux toolkit? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I am very, very sorry. Um, please, please modernize that code to use Redux toolkit right now. Not only will it get shorter, it was also designed to eliminate a lot of common mistakes. Um, as an example, accidental mutations were always the number one cause of Redux bugs, and we specifically designed Redux Toolkit to eliminate that particular class of bugs. Uh, as with React, we have a Redux DevTools extension as well, and again, this is one of the great things about using Redux, is that you can see a history of the actions that were dispatched in the application. 
you can see for each of those actions what values were contained in the action. You can see what, how the state changed as a result of that update, and you can see what the final result was after, after the action as well. Okay, last little bit. Got a quick demo coming up here if the network cooperates. We said earlier that reproducing the issue is absolutely key. You know, being able to say, here are the steps to make it happen, and that's criti for, critical for being able to go in, know where to investigate, and be able to fix it later on. But you know, a lot of times, you know, maybe you've, you've added some breakpoints, and you get there, and you pause, and you're investigating, and you step to the next line of code, and you step to the next line. Whoops, I just went one line too far. F5, reload the page, start over, step, step. Whoops, I went too far. And you have to kind of keep repeating this pattern in order to be able to investigate. Or if you're, if you're adding if console logs, you add five console logs, you realize it's not enough information, you add 10 more, reload the page, repeat, repeat, repeat. So I mentioned earlier that my day job is working for a company called Replay, and we build a time-traveling debugger for JavaScript. And the idea is that if you can record yourself making the bug happen once, now you have the ability to jump back and go to any point in time to investigate and see what actually happened in the code. So the basic idea is, first record yourself using the app with our modified version of Chrome that has the time travel recording baked in. And then once you've done that, you can open up the, the recording in our graphical debugger and now you can investigate it with time travel superpowers. You can jump to any point in time, see the code that executed. You can add print statements even though they didn't exist in the original code. And then you have all the other browser debugging tools. You can see the DOM elements and the source code and the variables and everything else. Uh, we even have the React dev tools integrated. And in a lot of ways, our goal is to be a better debugger for React than the official React deb debugger extension. So let's see if this is going to cooperate. We will reload this because the server has, of course, timed out while I was talking. Loading, loading. OK, so what I have here is a recording of a small Redux to-do application. And if I look at it to begin with, we've got sort of the, the video playback view where we can see that you know, during the recording, we had a to-dos application because, of course, we had a to-dos application. And we loaded some to-dos, and we added a few, and we deleted a few, and we toggled some filters. Done. But if we come over here to the DevTools tab, this actually starts to look a lot like the browser dev tools, and that's very intentional. So we still have the video preview over here, but if I bring up todos slice.ts, here's some of the Redux source code for this application. And if you look over here on the side, yeah, we have the line numbers, but you know, next to the line numbers, we also have these, these little blue numbers as well, and those are hit counts. Those actually show us here's how many times each line of code ran during the length of the recording. And so, for example, I can see that this to do color selected at reducer got hit twice. Now, I'm kind of curious what things actually happened. So, if I come here and I hit the plus sign, it adds a print statement, and we've got two messages being logged because the line of code ran twice. Well, what I, what I really want to know is what color was coming in here. So I can add a message that says, you know, to do color selected. And then I'm going to actually log a value just like I would with console.log. And oh, it, it ran twice. And the first time it came in, it printed, we had the color red. And the second time it came green. And those messages weren't in the original line of code. I'm, I'm checking this out afterwards. So time travel debugging is a very powerful thing. Uh, right now, we're playing with some experimental React debugging features. If you, and I would love to hear your thoughts on what are some problems you run into debugging React applications to give us an idea of what we might want to work on. So that's all the time I've got. 
Hopefully this has given you some insight into how to approach debugging, how to think about it systematically, and some useful techniques to work in your daily, in daily jobs. Thank you very much. Come talk to me later. <laughs>